Hi everybody and welcome to another episode of Gaffer and Gear. Today, finally, I get to show you some footage that I've worked on. Um, it's very difficult to, to get to show you anything that I do. Uh, even behind the scenes photos, incredibly difficult. We have to get uh, permission from artists, um, if it's a TV commercial from the product owners, from parent companies. It's just way too hard to do. And a lot of the time, uh, the actors are like, yeah, sure, no problem at all. But as soon as we approach their agents, they, they want some money. So it's incredibly difficult. A very, very big thank you to Rod Pollard, the cinematographer, for not only allowing me to, to show his work, but also for giving me some of the footage to show. Um, in today's episode, I can't even show you the entire finished product. I can't show you the TV commercial but I can show you selected shots for which we have permission to show. So anyway, um, here are the shots we're gonna be having a look at. Okay, so as you've probably guessed, um, it's for a skincare commercial and it was for the Chinese market. So uh, in this video, we're just gonna talk about the glamour shots, um, just to keep this video short. So let's start off by having a look at one of the simplest glamour shots first. So the brief of this shot was quite simple. They just wanted her against a white wall with a bit of white lace dangling in the background um, shot at a high speed. So Rod managed to persuade them not to shoot it against a wall, which I think was a very, very good decision. So instead we put up a 12 by 12 and shot her against that. So the advantages shooting it against a diffusion as opposed to a white wall are that uh, we can light the wall independently of her. So if we say had a white wall here and we're trying to light that from the front, uh, we have to try and dodge all of our hardware. We have to try and get around shadow issues. Whereas if we have the light behind the set lighting a transparent background, uh, we don't have to worry about those issues. Basically, we can light it and have no shadows. Now, there is a downside to doing this if you're thinking about doing it, and that is you need really good lenses. Otherwise, you're just gonna get um, a screen full of lens flare. So Rod has some very, very good primes. Okay, so the other things too that enables us to do is change the color. So we could put a gels package on, which we did, and that doesn't affect anything else in the, in the foreground uh, elements because we're not putting light through the foreground uh, at any stage. It's all going through the background. Other things you can do, which we didn't, but other things you can do is you could spot this light up and basically have a vignette. So things like that, very, very simple to do, gives us a lot more options. Okay, now let's get onto her key light. So her key light was a Sky Panel S60C set to 5,600 degrees Kelvin running through an octodone. So the first thing I'm gonna point out here is why are we shooting daylight? Well, we're in a location with lots of windows, so we couldn't afford to black out the entire location. We just had to manage the light as best we could and we didn't want any daylight uh, coming in and contaminating our set with a different color. Otherwise, pretty much, um, I would go tungsten lights for glamour shot, old school tungsten, because it's, it's way better color rendition than any lead that's out on the market. But um, anyway, we went with a Sky Panel S60 through an Octodone. So why an Octodone? What advantage does an Octodone have over, say, just using a blade frame or a diffusion frame? Well, the advantages are that it's all contained on one light stand. So if I need to move it and do any trims, basically the light and the diffuser move together. So that was important because I was working by myself. The other problem is, or the other advantage to octodones is you don't get any spill light out the sides. Everything's contained and goes through the front diffuser. Apart from uh, those reasons, there, there's no advantage really to using a, an octodone. Now, um, apart from the octodone, we also had a uh, bounce card in front of her just to fill in under the chin. Now we didn't want to have another light source casting more shadows and giving us distinct reflections in the eyes. We just wanted some passive fill. Now that bounce is three foot by five foot. 
Now the reason I like to use five foot wide bounces is they have a nice wrap. So next up we want to put some contrast and contour back into her face. So instead of using a fill light or a bounce board, we put up some negative fill instead. So we just used two floppies for speed. Now lastly was the background. The color wasn't quite right. Initially, we had everything color matching, so it was white on white. So uh, I took a meter reading off uh, the HMI and basically set the octodone to that, uh, the sky panel to that and got a perfect match. And it just looked too sterile. Her face, her skin tones didn't pop out of the background and we needed that to happen because it's a skincare commercial. So in the end, we, uh, we blued up the uh, HMI a little bit more. I think we used a one quarter uh, CTB. So basically it was a higher Kelvin point, a bluer Kelvin point. And then we added some magenta as well, just to get it a little bit creamier. Now the last thing some of you are probably looking at here is you're looking at the HMI and noticing it's a 2.5K HMI. So we were running off house power. Now in Australia, we're 230 to 240 volt, so we can actually run a 2.5K HMI off house power. So next up we'll have a look at the evening fireplace scene. Now initially our brief for this was white on white, but we just felt it wasn't going to feel like evening if, if it was white on white. So what we did is uh, when um, she was in makeup and, and everyone was dealing with, with them, the S60C that we have in the corner which is giving her her edge light um, in the shots, the S60C, we programmed in a few other modes in it. So we programmed in, I think, straight tungsten, um, a little bit warmer, I think tungsten with a gels package, and then we programmed the fire effects mode into it. So uh, basically, when the client came back on set, um, we had it lit pretty much as to their brief, which was white on white, no, no yellow, no, no, no warmer tones. And we suggested, do you wanna see how it would look if the background was warmer? Um, they said, how long is that going to take? Literally pressed a button and bang, the sky panel switched over and, and they, they loved it. Then we said, do you want to see the fire effect? So we set up the fire effect um, and th they loved that even more. So that's the advantage with LEDs is, is you, can, uh, you can have a plan B or a plan C and you can have it uh, pre-programmed into the lights. So that's, that's one huge advantage that LEDs have. So anyway, getting into the setup. Um, so this is her sitting on the couch here in my rather pathetic drawing, um, and we had the, the camera here. Now, uh, the big problem we had is controlling the light that's, uh, that's in the venue, because we were actually uh, filming in a reception center. Um, so we had two windows here, and luckily the camera department was nice enough to, um, to, to man those and, and start blacking those windows out, so that, that saved, uh, saved me a heck of a lot of time. Um, uh, basically, we had to control the light coming in, so I had a, a 12 by 12 black here, so just behind the camera a 12 by 12 black on the other side, so we had an entranceway. And the other problem we had was um, in the back of shot was a mirror above the fireplace. And you could see back over the top of the camera and see the rest of the reception venue down here. So I put up the uh, a third 12 by 12 black down the other end of the set to mask any reflections in the mirror. Now for this setup, I'll go the opposite way. I'll start talking about the background and work our way forwards. Okay, so. As I've already mentioned, we had a, had a Sky Panel S60C up in the top corner, which was uh, giving uh, talent her edge light or kick light or scratch light, depending on what country you're in. So that was lighting down this way, giving her her edge. But I also positioned it enough so that it was spilling onto the background and giving our background that warm yellow color. Now, the problem we had is we had too much light bouncing around back there. It just looked uh, too unbelievable for that to be from a fireplace or from um, ambient light fixtures that happen to be in the room. So we put an additional two floppies up uh, to get rid of any bounce off the wall and also soak up some additional light back there. Now, the next light in the setup was a uh, two by two Nung one, so two foot by two foot. Uh, biflex panel which we just had on a menace arm and that was giving her her backlight on her hair. Now this was shot about a year ago so if I was shooting this now that would most likely be a 3x3 Aladdin instead. 
All right, so the next thing I'll talk about is the fireplace. So basically the marble work around the fireplace was disappearing in the darkness. So we wanted to illuminate that up, but not light any of the wall around the fireplace itself. So for this, we used a DLED Turbo 7 with a Dido projection mount. So basically this was acting like a mini Leco or a mini projection system. So with the cutters, I could fine tune the edges of the light beam so it didn't spill onto the wall. Okay, now I almost forgot to mention the Dido light was uh, set to neutral white, so 5,600 Kelvin. Next up, sort of isn't my department, but um, the art department supplied a chandelier uh, to be in reflection in the mirror, just to give the, the place a, a little bit of a more classier feel. I don't do chandeliers, but I do supply all the rest of the hardware to rig it. So um, that, was, uh, that was a nice touch. And finally, we'll get on to lighting her. So she was lit with uh, two Octodones again, uh, Sky Panel S60s. Uh, her key light was uh, set to daylight. Her, um, her fill light was, uh, was reduced and warmed up. So I can't remember what the ratios were. It was pretty much done by eye on the day. And uh, when we got into our close-ups, we just moved the lights in closer so they'd give more wrap, uh, reduce the uh, intensity so we matched our f-stop and also brought in our bounce card again just to give us some passive fill from the front and also fill in under the chin. And the last thing we'll talk about today is this sequence here where she looks deep and meaningfully into the product. So with this uh, sequence here, I'm gonna talk about foreground elements and work our way to background elements. Okay, so I'll just run you through my really badly drawn diagram. So there's the camera facing that way. And uh, she's here uh, facing this way with a long table in front of her. Um, so in terms of uh, foreground elements, the first foreground element we have is some out of focus glassware on the front of the table. That's just giving us a bit of dazzle. So that is lit with a, uh, a DLED Turbo 7 full spot uh, set to daylight and uh, probably dimmed. So the good thing about the, uh, the Dito range of products, there's no spill light. Now the next foreground element is actually the product itself. Now it amazes me how many shoots I do where um, we can have a beautiful presenter and everybody forgets to light the product. The presenter looks fantastic. Everybody forgets to light the product. So the products, why we get employed? So the products got to look good. So the key side of the product was actually lit with a 6x6 diffusion frame with a sky panel S60C punching through that. So what appears to be the key side in the bottle is actually a reflection of the 6x6. Now the fill side of the product, Rod didn't want that to be as bright. So it looked like it had a key side. So the, uh, the fill side is quite literally a bounce board, uh, one of my five foot by three foot canvas boards. So the fill side of the bottle is literally a reflection of the canvas board. So the next element into the shot is uh, talent. So um, she's lit with a Octodone um, sky panel package, uh, basically punching in through the side. And we had that really, really close. So a big five foot light source gets a beautiful wrap around her. Now her uh, hair light is actually a four by one um, Nanguan Biflex uh, unit. So that's on a boom arm, just giving her, you know, just giving her some detail in her hair. Now on the opposite side, uh, we had an Octodone, again, another, another sky panel Octodone. And we set that to 4,800 degrees Kelvin. And the reason we warmed it up is so that it looked like it was being motivated by the chandelier. Now into the uh, last of the background elements, we've got our chandelier that's uh, on a boom arm position where we want to put it. Um, again, art department supply the chandeliers. I don't supply chandeliers. Um, on the other side of the set, we've got a plant just giving a, a bit of foliage, a bit of greenery. Now, believe it or not, that plant is lit with a Dido light from across the other side of the set. So basically here's the plant, here's the Dido light in full spot. That's a DLED Turbo 7. And basically full spot, lighting that plant up without contaminating the rest of the set. Uh, on the wall, some, there's some detailed sunlight coming in and that's a 2.5K HMI Fresnel coming in through a window, basically uh, lighting that side of the set there. So the reason I went to Fresnel is we wanted some shape to it. So we had some lace curtain um, over the front of the window. We wanted to get that texture. 
um, and basically um, the lamp head was too close to the window for me to get uh, enough separation to get some shape into a par light. So I needed to go a Fresnel. Now the last element is the background wall and that's lit with a sky panel S60C set to daylight. Now we've got a snap grid on that so that we can degradate the light going up the wall so that uh, Talent's head pops out from the background. Thank you for watching another episode of Gaffer and Gear. Um, I just want to explain why I do a video like this because a lot of people find it weird that um, that I'm giving away my secrets uh, and my hacks. Um, I hate that word hacks. I, I, I'm not telling you anything you wouldn't eventually learn. I'm just, just helping you get there a little bit faster. But the main reason I do a video like this is to try and get the message across um, to people further up the food chain than, than I am. Try and get the message across that gaffers have knowledge we're not just people who put lights on stands, okay? So this is a really basic shoot that we just looked at in this video. It's a really basic shoot. And I think a lot of people further up the food chain than me watching this video will actually be surprised how much thought, care and detail goes into a shoot like this by not just me, but also by the cinematographer. And um, that's, it's just, that's not valued at the moment. It just, it just seems to be that, that Gaff is a, a, a thought of as people who put lights on stands and, and that's it. And number two, so that the young guy coming up who wants to be a gaffer at least gets some knowledge from somewhere because it must be a real struggle at the moment. Um, before we go, um, here's some more footage from, from the shoot, some other shots I didn't uh, get time to talk about. Um, thank you again to Rod Pollard for, for giving me uh, the footage and for uh, letting me share, um, share his work uh, on this channel. And uh, look, just enjoy Rod's work and uh, see you on the next episode of Gaffering Gear.